considering coming back here to spend more time with us or something to think about. Uh, this morning I want to introduce to you uh, my best friend <laughs> <laughs> from Mesa, Arizona. His name is Andy Poland. Andy is a former Mormon. He is now the director of, are you the director, right? Yes. Of Concerned Christians in Mesa, Arizona. And Andy has a great story. Um, is able to do things that I can't because I never was Mormon, uh, teach things that I really can't because I never experienced those things. And so, God, God bless you, Andy. Thank you for coming. Some of you have heard my story before, and uh, I'm going to be telling my story, but I'm going to be putting a little bit different focus on it than just about feelings. I mean, that was the key reason for why I started doubting Mormonism, but there were some other things that God was working on with me about salvation. And so to help you understand why I believed in Mormonism, uh, when I was uh, 14 years old, we had a youth conference at Brigham Young University, and uh, the youth leaders challenged us to gain a testimony to know if Joseph Smith was a prophet. And what that means is they wanted us to pray and ask God to give us a special revelation to tell us that Joseph Smith was a prophet. And I decided that I wanted to do that. And so that night, I read a few passages from the Book of Mormon, and I prayed, and I asked God, and I got this really warm, peaceful feeling. And I believe that God had just told me that Joseph Smith was a prophet. Now, up to this point, I was kind of going along through the motions as Mormon. Um, doing, you know, good stuff, but I, I really didn't know if I believed in it or not. But at this point, once I got this answer, I believed that God had spoke to me directly, and so I felt like I had this special relationship with God. And not only that, I felt like I had this, uh, well, you know, the church... Um, was like the, the light in a dark tunnel to me, okay? I felt like Joseph Smith was everything that ever could be. And, uh, and so I started really paying attention at church and really uh, uh, put it, devoting myself to uh, being a good Mormon. Now, I was already a good kid as it was. I was a straight-A student, and I uh, did lots of good things in, in uh, church and school. But now I started getting prepared for my mission. I started studying the scriptures intently, understanding Mormon doctrine uh, from the Mormon perspective so that I could uh, be able to teach people what the Mormon gospel was when I went on my mission. Uh, one particular year, um, I uh, was attending seminary and they were studying the Doctrine and Covenants. And uh, we got to section 132 of the Doctrine and Covenants, which talks about polygamy. And I was really, well, I, was, I just didn't know what to think about it. I, I didn't know what to think about polygamy because the church didn't practice polygamy. And I thought, this is really strange doctrine. Why would God give this to Joseph? But I thought, you know, I had prayed to know if Joseph Smith was a prophet. And I had this special relationship with God. And so I'm going to ask God if polygamy is true as well, if he really, if he really did receive that. Uh, and so I prayed about it, and uh, I got this really good, peaceful feeling again that uh, God had indeed revealed that to Joseph Smith. And I was also told through a thought that one day I would practice polygamy. Now, I didn't want to practice polygamy, and I didn't like that idea, but um, this is God speaking to you. You do what God tells you you're going to do. But I'm thinking, how is this going to work? The church doesn't practice polygamy today. I would be excommunicated if I was practicing polygamy. So why in the world would God tell me that? Uh, and so I thought, well, wait a minute. My seminary teacher told me that when Christ returns, that polygamy would be brought back. And I was also told in my patriarchal blessing uh, that I would live when Christ returns during the millennium. And so I thought, oh, I'll be practicing polygamy when Christ returns. This is kind of put that up on a shelf and forgot about it. So the time comes for me to finally put my papers in to go on my mission. And I loved being a missionary. I was good at it. I loved going and telling people about this special relationship they could have with God and that they could know that Joseph Smith 
was a true prophet, just like I had learned. Um, 18 months into my mission, we had a, a, a special visitor that came out. It was Elder Kikuchi, who's one of the general authorities. And uh, he challenged us that we needed to have a, uh, this sacred grove where we committed ourselves to follow God no matter what. And I, I felt a real strong desire to do that that night. And so I went and I prayed and I, I told God that um, I wanted to follow him no matter what. And I had this really warm, peaceful feeling that I had felt many times by now come over my body. And this thought and question come to my mind said, Andy, would you follow me even if your first wife is going to die? And I'm thinking, wow, that is just so, I don't want that to happen. Um, and I'm thinking, well, wait a minute, there's got to be a reason why God's telling me this. Elder Kikuchi did not come to our mission on a whim. God prepared for him to be there, and God's trying to prepare me for something bad that's going to happen. And so I told him, yes, I would follow him even if my first wife was going to die, even though I didn't want that to happen. Now, I thought I was a really committed missionary, but my, last, uh, my second to my last area, I came across a book called The Miracle of Forgiveness. It was one of my areas. Uh, my companion uh, had been breaking one of the mission rules and he had a pet. And these pets were rats. Okay? <laughs> now, I didn't think much about it and I wasn't going to tell him to get rid of his rats. Um, but these dang rats, uh, didn't, we didn't keep the cage that clean. They, we let them crawl all over us and they got both of us sick. Okay, and we were sick for about a week, and that's when I discovered this book. And I thought, you know, I've never read this book. I'm going to take some time, and I'm going to read it. Um, and so, when I started reading it, I became more and more convinced about how sinful I was, and how I needed to keep the commandments. Um, if you go to the next slide, yeah, this miracle of forgiveness. Now, Spencer, I wanted to do anything I could to not have to listen to him. I was trying to wiggle my way out of listening to Spencer because, you know, Mormons, whenever they're uh, confronted with a problem and uh, one of the prophets says something they don't like, they'll say, ah, I'll try and figure out a way to not have to listen to this guy. That's just his opinion, whatever, okay? But the problem was is that Spencer was too good at what he did, and he quoted uh, Mormon scriptures that I couldn't run away from. And so the first of these, actually there was three of them. The first of these was in Doctrine and Covenants 82.7 and 82 verse 10 and Alma 34.34. 34. And so I want to spend some time, I want to read these with you. So let's go to the next slide. All right, this is uh, Doctrine and Covenants 82.7. And now verily I say unto you, I the Lord will not lay any sin to your charge. Go your ways and sin no more. But unto the soul who sinneth shall the former sins return, saith the Lord your God. Now after I read that, I realized how imperative it was for me as a Mormon to stop sinning. Because if I didn't stop sinning, those words, right straight from the Doctrine and Covenants, would mean that my former sins would return. Now... Mormons are great. They like to try and categorize things and not make it as bad as it really is. This scripture isn't very clear. It doesn't say whether all of your sins are coming back or if it's just a category. And so I thought, well, that must just talk about a category of my sins. So it can't be all of my sins returning because, dang, that would be a lot of sins. <laughs> okay, so uh, if I told a lie to someone uh, and all my lies would come back to me, but now all my other sins I'd be okay for. It, all right, so that was how I reasoned that scripture out. But it still was a lot of weight because... Even if it was just one sin, I was going to be on the hook for all of those types of sin. Uh, and so that really, that caused a lot of distress in my life. Now I want to read this next verse. Uh, this is in D&C 82, verse 10. I, the Lord, am bound when you do what I say, but when you do not what I say, ye have no promise. Oh, if I could only express to you how my heart felt when I read that there was no promise if I didn't do what he said. And so that meant that I had to do everything the Lord said or I was basically out of luck. Everything that he promised. See, all of my faith was predicated on the fact that God was going to fulfill his promise 
to me if I do what my part is. Okay? And so if I no, go back. Oh, I don't want to put you on the next slide. <laughs> if I don't do what he says, you have no promise. That means you lose everything. And now some Mormons are quite content with living in one of the lower kingdoms, so the terrestrial or the telestial kingdom. But I was not content with that. Because I knew that if I went to the terrestrial or the telestial kingdom, I would be cut off from the presence of Heavenly Father forever. And regardless of how good those other places were, that's still hell to, in my eyes. In my Mormon eyes, that's still hell because I would be cut off from God the Father forever. And I didn't want that. And so I made a promise to myself that I was going to do everything that I could to keep my side of that bargain, you know. And so the next scripture that really drove it home for me was in Alma 34 and 34. It said, you cannot say when you are brought to that awful crisis that I will repent. Now this awful crisis that Alma's referring to is death. Okay, because Mormons like to reason, well, Maybe I can't do it in this life, but I can always do it in the next life, okay? And Spencer was very clear in his message, you can't do it except in this life, okay? You can't repent in the next life. And I'm thinking, there's got to be some wiggle room in the scripture somewhere. But then he quotes this dang verse, okay? <laughs> you cannot say when you're brought to that awful crisis that I will repent, that I will return to my God. Nay, you cannot say this, for that same spirit with us possess your bodies at that time, that you go out of this life, that same spirit will have power to possess your body in that eternal world. So here's the deal. I have to do it now. I have to do it before I die. And the problem was, is I kept screwing it up. And it wasn't big sins. I'm on my mission. I'm doing, I'm serving the Lord 24-7, going out there pre proclaiming his gospel. Well, at least that's what I thought. Uh, and, but yet I would, there were things that I didn't do. Okay, it's the sins of omission, the things that I was supposed to do but I didn't do, and the sins of uh, thought sins, you know, uh, all it would take for me, I'm a 19-year-old boy, I see a woman, and 10 seconds later, I'm already committing sin, okay? And uh, I think guys understand that more than, than women do. Um, but, uh, you know, so I didn't want to do anything wrong, and I knew that if I did anything wrong, I had no promise. Uh, and so I worked so hard to try and get everything right. Now, let's go to the next slide. There, there's a couple things that um, I used to do to, to help myself get through this, okay? Um, first, I would reason, well, Alma did it in the Book of Mormon. Joseph Smith did it. Nephi did it. So there must be a way to do it. I just haven't figured out how to do it yet. And so that's how I would get from day to day. I'm screwing up. I'm messing up. I'm still having sins. Uh, being returned to me, but there must be a way to do it because these other men had to do it. So that's how that's how I helped myself get through it. Now, sacrament meetings also became very important to me, and there's a reason why. Because in Mormonism, we're taught that when you partake of the sacrament, you have all of your sins being taken away. They're washed away just like you were baptized. All right, and you and you renew your covenants. Now, one of the covenants that you make. Uh, at baptism is to keep all of the commandments, okay? And so I would renew my covenant, and I'd get washed clean, and that would last as long as I wasn't sinning, okay? Now, usually, and even with the hardest attempt that I was making, usually it would take only 10 or 15 minutes before I would do something wrong, thoughts in something. Somebody's up there at the podium, they're speaking, they're boring, and I'm thinking about how boring they are. Why can't they get along? And, and I've got these evil thoughts in my head towards this individual. And all of a sudden I realized, oh no, God said if I hate my brother in my heart, I've already committed murder. And I'm thinking, oh. So I, I have to wait all next week again. Now, if I was really good, I was really, really good. And I have to stress this. I was 
very focused. I wanted to make sure that everything I was doing was right. It, and I was trying really hard. If I was really good, I could go three hours, the whole church meeting, not sin once. I'm serious. That's really hard to do. If you've ever tried to do it, it is very difficult. Okay? And, but then at the end of the church service, something would happen, and I would screw up again. Or I'd forget about my focus should be always on the Lord, or I, I forgot to stop, or I stopped praying because you're supposed to pray always. Uh, and so that sort of stuff, uh, you know, would happen. And so then I would have to wait another week until I could reset the button. So this is the stuff I was struggling with on my mission. And so I was still struggling when I got back from my mission, when I went home and I started attending a singles ward and uh, my number one priority, I have to keep all the commands of God. I need to find a wife and get sealed in the temple. That is the number one duty of a missionary that returns home. And so I started attending a singles ward and I find my wife to be, we start dating and uh, we get engaged and about two weeks before we're going to get engaged, I thought, you know, if she's going to be the one, I should probably tell her what I had learned on my mission, that she's going to die. <laughs> of course, that discussion didn't go so well. Um, my wife kind of looked at me and said, well, I don't want to die. This is, I, I think you're wrong. And I'm like, well, look, this is how I want her over. It's real simple. I don't know how long you're going to live, Lori. As far as I know, you can live a really long life. I just know that you're going to die before I do. Okay? And so she accepted that. I'm a priesthood holder. She's a good born woman. And, uh, and so she accepted that as coming from God. So we, fortunately for me, we were still still in the temple two weeks later, which I love. Uh, and we, I, you know, I think we had what we envisioned in our mind, the idyllic Mormon life. We're married. We're going to have kids. Uh, you know, we're working hard, we, we would volunteer down at the temple. We were temple guides. You know, we, uh, missionary work was so important to us that we were actually there uh, doing missionary work in the temple before my wife got pregnant. And then she got pregnant, so we were on to the next step, you know, uh, of uh, creating our family. And uh, so things are going great. I mean, I even was uh, in the uh, Easter pageant. I was a shepherd. I grew out the nice red beard and, uh, you know, did all the things. The same guys that you're witnessing to at the street down here, I was one of those guys, okay? Uh, and so I loved Mormonism. I loved everything about it. I just was still screwing up. I was still doing things that were wrong. Little things, but I wasn't perfect yet. And I needed that perfection. I desperately needed it so that I could have that promise from God fulfilled. So about two years into our marriage, there was a woman uh, that was a friend of my wife's family that had just lost her job and had just lost her place to stay. And we thought, you know, we have an extra room in our house. We're going to invite her into our house because that's the Christian thing to do until she gets on her feet. And then uh, that, that's what we're going to do. And so we invited her into our house. And this is where uh, something really strange happened. I was not expecting this. Uh, she walked into my door, and I had this really calm, peaceful feeling overcome me and said, Annie, this woman walking through your door is your next wife. And I'm like, what? That, that can't be right. I, I'm, we're not practicing polygamy today. Something's wrong. But something else happened that was really strange. She knew my new name in the temple. And she didn't call me Andy everywhere I went. She called me my new name in the temple. My new name was Moses. And she called me Moses everywhere I went. And I'm thinking, God must be trying to tell me that she's the one because she knew my new name. But I'm thinking, you know what? This is too scary. If God really has this, that's what he wants, he's going to have to prove it. Okay? And so I just uh, kind of put her up on a shelf and tell anyone about it. I was frightened to death about that. So the next day I'm helping her drive around to look for work. And uh, again, I have this really strong impression, feeling that she's supposed to be my next wife. And I'm like, what? And this is wrong. I'm actually angry with God at this point that he would even bring this up to me. And um, as soon as I'm having this kind of argument in my mind, she speaks out of her mouth of how she's supposed to be my second wife. And I just, what? How, what, how did you know that? You know, I, I don't know. I don't know where that came from. And so we took that uh, as a sign from God that we were supposed to be together. And so 
I believe that God had given to me, given her to me directly, that I had such a special relationship with God because of my prayer life, that God was treating me the same way that he had treated Joseph Smith. Because Joseph was given wives uh, just like uh, Abraham and uh, Isaac in the Bible. That's how Mormons reason that sort of stuff out. Okay, uh, And so I, uh, we ended up committing adultery because I believe that was uh, ordained of God. And I knew that I was not following the standards of the church, but I was doing what God had told me directly. So that superseded anything else that I needed to hear. And it was a special uh, dispensation just for me because I was a special individual. At least that's what I reasoned about myself. And... Um, so I get a revelation during this time that there was a way that God was going to make this right in the eyes of the world. And what he was going to do is Lori was going to die in childbirth. And so I would have one wife in the celestial kingdom and I would have another wife here on earth. And so the time came for Lori to deliver. And uh, I'm going into the hospital. I'm expecting my wife to die on the table because that's what I was told. And so everything goes wrong. She delivers a healthy baby boy, <laughs> and she's not dying. And you do not know how devastated I was. You really don't. I was walking down the hallway, and I'm thinking, how in the world could this happen? And I had this thought come to me that said, Andy, you're a false prophet. Your prophecy didn't come to pass. But worse than that, I was an adulterer. I had committed adultery, and I had been deceived by the devil. And the only thing I had left was to go and tell my wife what I had done that was wrong to make it right. And I had to go back to the church and tell them that I had committed adultery. And that broke my heart, because I was such a good Mormon. How could this happen? I had this nagging problem for the bishops and state presidents. The bishop, I asked him, how do I know what's from God and how do I know what's from the devil? Because those feelings were identical. And there were supernatural things that happened that I knew were not of this world. But I know that they're not from God. How do I know for sure that that never happens again? Because I never want to be put in this position again. And my bishops and my state presidents did not have an answer for me. The best they could tell me is just keep reading my Book of Mormon and praying about it. And somehow God would reveal that to me. And I remember reading through the miracle of forgiveness about people that committed adultery. And that was one of those sins that was kind of a question mark attached to whether you could really recover from. And, but I thought, you know, I'm just going to do everything I can in the church to make it right. And so I went through this, uh, I went through the bishop's court or the, the uh, high council court and I was disfellowshipped. And actually, when they told me that I was disfellowshipped, I was actually angry at the time that I heard that because I felt like I needed to be excommunicated for what I had done. I needed some severe punishment, but they were very lenient on me because they knew how uh, broke up I was about what had happened, and they wanted me to go through the repentance process. So for the next two years, I was disfellowshipped. And I accepted it gladly, and uh, I was glad that I was not able to pray in church. I was glad that I was not able to speak or teach um, or partake in the sacrament, because I was able to start paying for my sin to make it right. And so after... Uh, those two years, I'm, I'm studying my scriptures and I'm still trying to find my answer. I want to know what's from God. I want to know what's from the devil. And um, I'm not finding it in the uh, Book of Mormon or the Bible or anywhere that I was looking. Um, of course, I wasn't studying the Bible very much. I was just studying the Mormon scripture primarily. And uh, I didn't find the answer. It wasn't, it wasn't there. And I thought, well, you know what? God must be waiting until I get my temple recommend back and he's going to reveal it to me when I start going through the temple again. Um, and you have to realize that I, my, up to this point, I had this special prayer relationship with God. And when I got deceived, I stopped praying like I did 
to God to receive answers because I knew that I could be deceived and I did not want that to occur. And so I felt like I was sort of like alone. I didn't have anything, and I, and I, but I was part of my punishment that I was inflicting upon myself so that I could pay back for my sin. So the time comes, I get my temple recommend back, and I'm hoping that there's going to be some kind of a doorway that opens that I'll be able to find my answer, and the heavens are just silent. There's nothing. And I, and I think, okay, well, God's just waiting to, until I get my life a little bit more active and, and involved. And so I was very active. I started uh, doing everything that was right. I started even, te- they gave me a call and I started teaching in the uh, priesthood meetings. And so I was doing everything I could to make it right. But after four years of trying to make it right, I kept hearing people tell about their testimony experiences of how they knew what was from God and what was from the devil. And everyone else around me seem to know because they've had these special experiences. And it was very painful for me to hear. And so I told my wife, you know what? It's too difficult for me to go to church and to listen to that. So I'm going to stay home. I'm going to read my scriptures and do that thing at home. And you can take the kids without me. Uh, I just, it's too painful. I can't do it. Uh, And so I went inactive for the next two years. Now, At the end of those two years, it's been six years from the time that I committed adultery, I had not received my answer from God, even though I looked everywhere. And I reasoned that the reason why I was not hearing from God is because I had committed a sin that was so grievous, that was so wrong, that was no longer covered by the blood of Christ. Because I had that special prayer relationship with God that because I committed adultery, God had to cut me off. And the only way that I was going to make it right is if I shed my own blood to pay for my own sin. That meant I was going to kill myself. Because I knew I couldn't go up to the bishop and say, hey, bishop, I need to be blood atoned. And they weren't going to do that for me. And so I reasoned that I would do it myself so that I would be able to pay for my own sins. And so, you have to understand why I was doing this. It was my last grasp at righteousness. If I had any chance of making it to the celestial kingdom, it had to be through my blood. And so I planned out when and where and how. I even went so far to plan it out so that it would not be hard to clean up. And I set the date for two weeks away. Now it was at this time that my brother Matt calls me up on the phone. Now, my brother, he had left Mormonism two years before, and he had converted to biblical Christianity. And I thought, you know, I have asked everyone else my question about uh, how to know what's from God and how to know what's from the devil. And I think, at this point, if I'm going to kill myself, I have nothing to lose by asking my Christian brother uh, if he has the answer. And so... I I thought, you know, even if he doesn't have the answer, I haven't lost anything. I can still carry out my plan. But at least I can say I tried every avenue. Uh, And so I went three hours early to meet with my brother uh, to this party that he was having. And uh, I told him that I didn't know what came from God and I didn't know what came from the devil. And there was a scripture that kept returning to my mind at that time. Uh, where Jesus talks about an evil spirit that goes out of the man, and this evil spirit roams the whole earth looking for a place to stay. And when that evil spirit doesn't find a place, he goes, you know what, I'll go back to the place where I started. And he goes back to the man's house, finds everything in order, and he finds seven spirits worse than himself, and the last state of the man is worse than the first. And I said, Matt, that is my future because I'm no longer listening to those demons. I'm not being deceived by them again. But I'm empty. I don't have anything. I'm just waiting for them to come back. And the last day of me to be worse. And so my brother, who, gives, who has a lot more smarts than I give him credit for, um, he told me, you know, there's a book that you need to read in. It's called The False Prophecies of Joseph Smith by Dick Bear. And he had an early version of that. And that early version was a letter by, from Dick. And he said, first thing... You can't trust your feelings. And I was like, well, duh. No, that's true. 
But then he did something that really surprised me. He quoted two Bible verses that uh, said that you couldn't trust your feelings. Proverbs 28, 26, and Jeremiah 17, 9. Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things who can know it. And then uh, Proverbs 28, 26 says, he that trusteth in his heart is a fool. And so here is the Bible, which I was really surprised about. I thought the Bible would tell me I could trust my feelings. Here's the Bible telling me I can't trust my feelings. And I knew that was true from my own experience. Then he goes and tells me how you know a true prophet from a false prophet has nothing to do with the spiritual manifestation, but has everything to do with whether or not his prophecy comes to pass. And then he quotes Deuteronomy 18, 19 through 22, which essentially says one false prophecy makes a false prophet because God knows everything that's going to happen. And then he proceeded to give all these prophecies that Joseph Smith gave that were false. And so I was really torn by the prophecies that were false because I wanted Joseph Smith to be a true prophet. I wanted to be a god. I really did. I wanted everything to work out for Mormonism. But I wanted to follow the truth wherever it took me. And the fact that Joseph Smith had false prophecies showed me that he wasn't speaking to God. And But more importantly... My answer was there. It was something that I could learn to know what came from God and what came from the devil. And it was through, not through a, a feeling or a spiritual manifestation, but simply by testing them with scripture. Okay? Uh, and so, I went back to my wife because I thought if I showed this stuff to her that she would leave Mormonism. And for the next three months, I tried to convince my wife that she needed to leave. And she kept telling me I was ruining her life and that I was going to outer darkness and she didn't want to have anything to do with what I was saying. So I went back to my brother Matt because I wanted to know if there was something I could believe in Christianity. Now the very first thing that I needed was I needed to know if the Bible was reliable. And so my brother, when he took me to the Christian church, I went to the church library and I told the librarian that I was coming out of Mormonism. And then I had some hard questions about the Bible and had hard questions about uh, Christianity. And, and uh, there was a person that was returning a book at the time. It's called A Ready Defense by Josh McDowell. And she says, you need to read this book. And so she gave me, made me a library card right there on the spot, not even a member of the church, and gives me the book to read. Uh, and uh, she gives my name to Jim and Judy Robertson to answer my hard questions from concerned Christians. So Jim calls up the next day and invites me to come down to Central to talk with him. And I'm kind of leery about meeting with Jim, because he's an evil anti-Mormon, and I heard a lot of bad things about him. <laughs> um, but uh, I thought I'd give him the benefit of the doubt. And so I went down and I met with them. And the, I was expecting them to kind of lecture me about how bad I had been for being a Mormon, and, but that's not what happened. The first question they asked me is, how is my kids doing with the fact that I was leaving Mormonism? Uh, the next question they asked me is, how is my wife doing with the fact that I was leaving Mormonism? And the last question that they asked me was, what did, did I have a reason to believe in the Bible, and did I have a reason to believe in Jesus? And then they told me that there was a support group that met on Thursday nights, that, I, that had four Mormons there, and that I would be invited to come and be a part of that. Well, by the time Thursday night rolled around, um, I had been reading that book that I got from the church library from cover to cover and sideways and back and forth because I just wanted to know what the answers were. And what Josh did for me is he helped me to understand that the Bible hadn't been changed. There are thousands and thousands of manuscripts of the Bible. And they all come from different locations, different time periods, and they all say the same thing. And what does that say? That says that we have the original teachings of the prophets and the apostles. They haven't been lost. So now it's just a question of whether or not I believed what the uh, Paul and the apostles had to say. And uh, there was this uh, little thing in the back of the book about how to become a Christian. And, uh, and I said, you know, I want that. And, um, and so I prayed a little prayer that was in there, and I thought, you know, there's got to be something else I need to do, because that was not it. <laughs> um, and I remember, have you guys ever had an angry prayer to God? Okay, I, I had an angry prayer to God that day. Um, because I was really, um, well, I was disappointed in myself. I wanted to be able to keep and do everything I needed to do so that God would be happy. And I knew that I kept falling short. And so I would, I, my angry prayer to God was, you know, God, if I'm going to get saved, you're going to have to do it because I can't. And I'm just oh, angry. <laughs> And 
And so, I didn't know that was God, what God wanted, but I was angry. <laughs> so that night I went down to Concerned Christians and I told them that I was uh, coming out of Mormonism and I was in the process of getting saved because I knew there was something else I needed to do. <laughs> And what they did is they opened up a scripture to me. They opened up several scriptures, but the one that broke the camel's back, so to speak, was uh, 1 John 5, 11 through 13. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. And so this was a really weird experience for me because my whole entire life up to this point, well, actually from 14 on, everything that was a spiritual truth came in some type of a spiritual manifestation or feeling. And... It wasn't like that. It was sort of like discovering 2 plus 2 equals 4. Um, one moment you don't know 2 plus 2 equals 4, the next moment you do. I knew what the scripture said. I knew that if I had faith in Christ, I had eternal life. And I knew that I had that faith. I knew it. And so therefore, I knew that that scripture applied to me. I had eternal life. <laughs> and I was forgiven. Everything that I was working for, I was working my entire life to have eternal life. It was the thing I was grasping onto with everything I had. And I realized that it wasn't anything about what I was doing for God, but rather what God did for me. Amen. And when I believed in Him, I got the greatest gift anyone can get, eternal life. I don't know how to describe the drive home. Um, I just had this feeling come over me that God had me in his hand and I could not be out of it. That he, no matter what happened from this moment on, I was in the kingdom of God. That's right. Praise God. And for someone that was such a sinner like me, those were pure, compassionate words that I needed to hear. And so I want to explain what this new salvation is to me. And so the first thing, one of the very first things that I learned when I started reading the book of Romans is about when I received forgiveness. Now, I really need to stress this. I know we like to spend a lot of time when we're trying to convince Mormons about what you need to do and how you get it, how you qualify. But I focus on one thing, and that's when I receive forgiveness. Not what I need to do, or what the qualifications are, but when I receive it. Because that made all the difference. In the verses that I just read from you, 1 John 5, 11 through 13, notice, he who has the Son, present tense, has eternal life. I write these things to you who believe right now that, that you may know that you have, not will have, have eternal life right now. Okay? Um, and so Abraham, if you go to the next uh, slide here, my forgiveness, oh, I'm sorry. Let me, let me contrast this with a little bit with Mormonism before I go, no, go ahead and go back. Let me contrast a little bit uh, with Mormonism. This is what I was taught. Everything, and you know, we like to focus on this verse, but remember, DMC 82.7 is a thing that haunted me, because if I sin, my former sins return. It doesn't matter here, okay, about after all we can do. 82.7 says after we can do, because if I sin again, my forgiveness is withdrawn, and I have to re-earn it, okay? And so, this is it's saying the same thing, so we labor diligently that, that it's by grace that we say after all we can do it. So that's what I was working for. So here, go on to the next slide. When I read this in Romans, this was so freeing. Blessed are they whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. 
Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will never count against him. Now, I'm going to ask a question. How long is never? Okay, so we're talking about not a temporary forgiveness. We're talking about a permanent forgiveness. Okay, very important. Is this blessedness only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? We have been saying that Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. Under what circumstances was it credited? Was it after he was circumcised or before? It was not after, but before. Now, that is huge, guys. More in mind, everything is after, okay? I have to be baptized if I'm going to receive forgiveness. But in the Old Testament, circumcision was that, baptism. The thing that you had to do before you could receive forgiveness. And Abraham received his forgiveness before he did the good work. So what does that mean? It means it's not about me. It's because he simply trusted in God and believed what he had to say was true and received forgiveness. That's great. That is such a good God. It's a merciful God. Let's go on to the next slide. Okay, this is, this is what I was trying for as a woman. In our journey toward eternal life, purity must be our constant aim, to walk and talk with God, to serve God and to follow His example and become as a God. We must attain perfection. Now, I want to say this, guys. Before I committed adultery, I thought it was possible. That's how big I had in my head. Okay, there's two types of individuals that are in Mormons, uh, any person that, for that matter. Either you think that you can keep all of the commandments and it's possible, or you realize that you can't and it's not possible. Okay? In his presence there can be no guile, no wickedness, no transgressions. In numerous scriptures he has made it clear that all worldliness not just a little bit, all worldliness, evil and weakness must be dropped before we can ascend to the hill of the Lord. It is a very heavy weight to carry. When you're talking to people on the street and they're carrying this weight, it's, it shows in them. They're depressed, they're upset, they're not happy, okay? For those that are happy, that think everything's okay, they're the ones that believe it's possible. I can do it. Okay? And so what do we have to give those that think it's possible? We have to tell them that it's not possible. We have to convince them. Now, here's a little secret. You're not going to be able to convince them that it's not possible. All you can do is give them what the, what the Mormon requirements are. Talk to them about what it means to sin. Talk about all sorts of types of sin. Help them help their own conscience realize that they're sinning. And what will happen is that God will continue to knock on their door over and over and over again, letting them know that they're not good enough. Okay? Let's go on to the next slide. All right. This is a strange verse to be very happy about, but I was thrilled when I read this in Romans. <laughs> I know that nothing good lives in me. That is my simple nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. Now, that perfectly described me. I have the desire to do what was good, but no matter how hard I tried, even at my best when I was on my mission, I still screwed up. And so when I read that in the Bible, I thought, you know, this book is talking about real people. It's not talking about, you know, a, a concept of maybe a possible you can make it. It's talking about a real person with real problems. And salvation applied to Paul. Paul was not worried about whether he had forgiveness. He knew that Christ was enough, even though he had that condition. Amen. Okay? Um, now, the, the people that we're talking about that think that they're perfect, I love this verse. If we claim to be without sin, 
we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. A very simple concept. It's very easy to lie to yourself. So let's go to the next one. All right. I love this scripture um, too uh, because in Mormonism, you know, this is what uh, draws the line. If you realize that you're, you cannot be saved in your sins in Mormonism, then you have to be perfect and you drive yourself to be perfect. Okay? Uh, I say unto you again that he cannot save them in their sins, for I cannot deny his word. And he has said that no one clean thing can inherit the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, how can you be saved except you inherit the kingdom of heaven? Therefore, ye cannot be saved in your sins. So if you commit sin, no salvation. Real simple concept. Let's go to the next slide, because this one is a great... Uh, well, this is, this is what I felt like I was having to happen all the time. Uh, on my mission, I, I had this feeling like God was returning this sack of sins at my door and asking me a question, Andy, when are you going to stop sinning so that I can completely forgive you? Now, at that time, I used to think that that was the devil saying that to me, just trying to kick me while I'm down here, okay? I now realize that that was the true God of heaven speaking to me and saying, Andy, you can't do it. He's trying to convince me through Mormon scripture that the law was impossible to keep, that I needed him. So let's go to the next verse. Um, this Romans 5, 6 through 8, you see at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man. Though for a good man, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Not at the, not at the pinnacle of my mountaintop of righteousness. That's not where Christ met me. Christ met me in the valley of my sin. Just a few weeks before I got saved, I was ready to kill myself. I was ready to put everything on the table so that I could make it. But while I was in that condition, that's where Christ met me. While I was still a sinner, that's where he saved me. And this type of love is unbelievable. And it's something that is just absolutely compelling to me. Let's go to the next slide. I love this verse. Um, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Let's go to the next slide. Now, this kind of draws the picture here. He's standing at the North Pole. Okay, God, if God said that he removed our sins from us from the, as far as the north is from the south, everywhere he's looking down at would be south. Okay? And it would be at that point you'd be able to find all of his sins. The same thing at the South Pole. Okay? Um, you'd be able to find all of the sins just lying there. But God said as far as the east is from the west. And I can keep traveling west as far as I want to go. And it doesn't matter. There's no point that it turns east. I can turn around and keep going east. And it doesn't matter how far I go in that direction. It doesn't turn into west. My sins have literally dropped off the map. There's no place that you can find them. They're gone. If they can't be found, they cannot be returned. Amen. They're gone. Now, as a Mormon, this, is, this kind of describes my relationship with God. Next, next slide. Um, I felt like God had this sword uh, over me. Okay, This is uh, Adam and Eve being expelled, expelled from the uh, Garden of Eden, but this is exactly how I felt about God. God had this sword just ready to chop me off every time I sinned because I would have no promise. Do you see how valuable what we're teaching is? We, we have a permanent condition with God that cannot be changed because of His love and what He did for us, not because of something I did for Him. I don't have the threat of being cut off from His presence because I have been set free from punishment. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Um, this is one of my scriptures that I uh, have on the back of my shirt. I give them eternal life, 
and they shall never perish. I'm going to ask this question again. How long is never? There, there are so many people that misquote this verse because uh, it says, what it says in the next one, no one can snatch them out of my hand. Some people will say, oh, but I can jump out. Okay? They are totally disregarding and they shall never perish. Never perish means that it's impossible for you to jump out. Can't do it. Okay? Go to the next slide. This is Paul. Being confident in this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Let's go to the next one. And this is another one. This is on the front of my shirt. Very true. Truly, I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who has sent me has eternal life. Has. Present tense. Right now. The moment that you believe. And will not be judged. Now that's very important. You guys, Mormons believe that we're judged by our works. Now that's very fine if they want to believe that. But remember there's two books. There's the book of death. There's the book of life. The book of death is the one that is everyone's judged out of their works. What they've done. And then they're thrown into the lake of fire. If their name is not written where? In the book of life but has crossed over from death to life. See, I am no longer in the book of death. I am in the book of life. Amen. Amen. So if they want to be judged by the works, that's fine. But I want to save them that trouble. I want them to be written in the book of life. Because that's what will save them, not their works. Go to the next slide. All right. Now, you probably have heard Mormons say this. When we talk about this free grace, okay, they say, well, then I guess you can just do whatever you want from that point on. You know, there's no reason to keep the commandments. Well, there's an assumption that they're making. I need to point this out to you. The assumption that they're making is that no one will keep the commandments unless they have the fear of punishment over them. That they have some type of being cut off from God forever. And so there is, it's just a, an assumption they make. You must be afraid in order to keep the commandments. But I'm telling you that there's something different. There's another reason to keep the commandments of God. Let's, let's go to the next slide. Okay, this is, this is my reason for keeping the commandments. Alright? There is no fear in love. But perfect love drives out fear. Because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he loved us first. Now there's a lot of stuff that's packed into this. Okay. First off, notice that I'm set free from the fear of punishment. Okay. That's the fear that I am separated from, the fear of punishment. There's another type of fear that we're going to talk about. And it's the fear of the Lord, which is actually different than this. I'm going to give you the biblical definition of what the fear of the Lord is in just a sec. Okay? But this fear of punishment is something that you have to have. If you're a true Christian, you must be separated from your fear of punishment. Okay? Now, when God saved me, I have a couple questions for you. When God saved me, did he have to save me? Was there anyone holding a gun in his head saying that if you don't save Andy, you're going to die? No. Did God gain anything when he saved me? Did he already own me? Yes. yes. So there's nothing he gained. There's nothing that he got out of the deal. God chose to save me, chose to die for my sins because he loved me. He decided that he saw my condition and was going to fix it just because he could. That's right. Okay? That is a strange kind of love for me because I was not worthy of his love. It's a kind of love that I've never experienced in all my life because every type of relationship I've had up to that point had a string attached to it. There was something I had to do so that they could give me something. 
Even my God that I worshipped as a Mormon had strings attached. I always felt like God was asking me, what have you done for me lately? Sort of thing. Okay? Because I was doing something wrong. I, I needed to clean myself up. And then God would be on, his, I would be on God's good graces. So it was always a trade-off relationship. But this crazy God, this one right here, this God loved me even though I didn't deserve it. I call it... And the most, uh, it's crazy love, okay? And I mean that in the most respectful way that I possibly can, because it doesn't make sense, but it is the absolute best love you can possibly have. Amen. And it's the reason why I can now love like he loved. Now, and there's a reason for that too, because, see, every time I was trying to keep the commandments in order to gain forgiveness, it was a trade-off relationship, okay? But now that I have been set free, I don't have to keep the law. And that's a good thing. I don't have to keep the law. But because I am saved, I want to keep the law. Just like God didn't have to save me, but he chose to save me. I can love just because. I'm not expecting something in return. I can actually give it away and never expect anything in return. And that's exactly the same way that God loved me. See, do you understand, until I was set free from the law, it was impossible for me to love the way that God loves. I couldn't do it. It was impossible. Now I can truly love the way that God loves. I have been set free so that I can truly live in his love by living out the commandments with those around me. See, the commandments benefit us. They benefit God, they benefit those around us, and we can give them away like we're reckless. Do it freely, because we can. All right, I don't know if it's... Okay, good. Let's go to the fear of the Lord. This is my favorite verse in Proverbs 8, 13. Okay? We were talking about there's two types of fears. One, as a Christian, you have to be set free from the, uh, the fear of punishment. Okay, that's the thing that you must be set free from. But you must retain the fear of the Lord. To fear the Lord is to hate evil. I hate pride and arrogance, evil behavior and perverse speech. See, if I truly have fear for the Lord, I hate my sin. See, Paul described it in Romans chapter 7. I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. He hates his sin, even though he is saved. He's free. He doesn't want to, he doesn't want to do those things that are wrong. I am so looking forward to the day that I can take this body right here and put it in the grave. You know why? Because this body sins against God. But the body I'm going to get, the resurrected body that I'm going to get, will no longer sin against God. Amen. That is something to look forward to. And guess what? I have the Holy Spirit as a deposit guaranteeing that body. Amen. And believe me, I'm going to claim it when I get there. <laughs> okay? Um, and so, this is, what we're this is what we're preaching. We are preaching true freedom. Okay? The focus that I would ask you to do. Now, I've got a number of these handouts. And you can see them. It's got all the scriptures that I have listed up here and even some more. Um, I've got handouts on the back table. Take as many as you want. If you want to hand them out tonight, that's fine. Or if you want to take them home and hand them out at your church, I don't care. I want you to understand that this is where freedom is. It's in Christ. It's the reason for why I'm alive today in more ways than one. Okay? And so, with that being said, uh, do you want me to close in prayer or should we? Um, you, can, you can pray. I'm gonna okay. Tell me if they have to move you. All right. Don't move. I'm praying in the new and Chip will come up. All right. Lord, we are so grateful for your love. Lord, we're so grateful that you have set us free from the law so that we can love the way you love. Lord, help us to share with those on the street tonight the love that you have given us. The stuff that we can just give away because we can, Lord. Thank you, God, for that blessing. Thank you for setting us free from our sin. Lord, thank you for setting us free from the fear of punishment, being eternally separate from you, because I can truly come to you and not be afraid of you, but just love and respect you, Lord. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.